congratulate her. Getting a Master of Education is um, no mean feat, but she's done well. Also pray for Bruce and Jeannie. Um, Bruce has had a, a couple, quite a few falls the last yesterday, and in one of those falls he's broken up, he's uh, injured his fingers. He looks as though he's broken his fingers. So um, they're all swollen, but complicated to that. I think it's about Wednesday they're heading off to Tasmania for two weeks with their daughter. So just pray for them that Bruce can be organised and get things done, but that's why they're not with us this morning. Today, our last commandment, do not covet. Do not covet. And it's the tenth one. And it's interesting because, well, maybe it's because of the last one and people are saying, hurrah, we finished the Ten Commandments. But it's probably one of the most important commandments because it encompasses all the other commandments, as we will see. But the question this morning I would like to ask us, am I guilty of covetousness? What evidence is there that condemns me this morning that I'm guilty of this offence, of being covetous? Am I covetous? Is there enough evidence to convict me? Because you know what? It's a sin that everybody does. It's a sin that everybody is guilty of and yet no one will admit to it. There is not a person here that will say, yep, I'm covetous. Yep, it's me. I do it every day. We don't do that because we can't see what covetousness is. We can see what it does, but this morning we're going to look at it a little in depth. But as someone has said, covetousness is a trap that is set to lure us to satisfy our inner thirst for something we desire and badly want. It dangles something of delight before our eyes and promises that it will satisfy our innermost cravings if we get it. But the reality is all it achieves is we want more and more and more and more. That is why God has given us this commandment. Do not covet, do not get caught in the trap of wanting more things that will never satisfy you. And I think sometimes we've got to learn the hard way. But, and this is the verse. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. Pretty specific, isn't it? Now, I have called this a crisis of covetousness, the crisis of covetousness. In our modern age, coveting is one of the most easiest things that you and I can do. Now, what do I mean when I make that statement? What does it mean to covet? Because if I don't understand what coveting is, then I can never really say, well, yeah, that's me. But coveting uh, is, in simple terms, to yearn to possess. It is the des- to have a desire to long for, to crave, and it usually means that it is something that belongs to somebody else and coveting is about wanting what somebody else has. Now, the Apostle Paul uses a word in the New Testament, epithemo mio, and it means something that's stronger here than in the Hebrew. And it means to lust after, to set the heart upon with a passionate desire and yearning. I must have it. I will not be denied it. I will not be satisfied until I get it, is the idea or thought behind being covetous. Coveting your neighbor's house is more than a desire for wanting your neighbour's house. It's a resentment towards your neighbour because they have it and you don't. 
While coveting and greed often go hand in hand as partners, there's a subtle difference between being greedy and being covetousness. A greedy person isn't satisfied with a thing or a person because a greedy person doesn't just want a thing, they want everything. A greedy person wants everything that they can get. So they don't generally resent what others have, they just see them as opportunities to get what they want. And if you're in a way, you're simply an obstacle that must be removed in order for a greedy person to get what they want. To them, it's not personal, it's business. You want it, you've got it, I want it, I'm taking it. End of story. Whereas covetousness is a personal thing. Now, I have said that covetousness is an easy thing for us today. And why I say that, because I don't have to look over my back fence or over this fence to see what my neighbour's got. I don't have to look and see his house or his car or how many possessions or whatever he's got. I don't have to do that anymore. His spouse, his servants or his possessions. And you know why? Because I simply have, all I have to do is push one device. Any moment of the day, all day if I want to, and I'm connecting to the world. I can connect to the world. And when I say that, often in our day and age, the first thing that's switched on in the morning is this device. It's switched on. And the last thing we turn off before we go to bed at night is this device. It is something that has become our constant companion throughout the day. And in many cases, we become dependent upon it to catch up with what's happening in the world. All the latest and greatest news, what's happening throughout the world, just press this thing and Allah, you've got, you can go anywhere in the world and find out what is happening. And this new technology, it has impacted our lives in more ways than you know I care to admit. It's so tempting for us to see what other people are doing, what other people are saying on social media platforms. It enables us to compare ourselves with other people and their activities in just a split second. We can see what they're doing. It can also set off a process within us where we become jealous of what they have where we become jealous about what they're doing and so we then become dissatisfied with what we have and then we begin to desire to covet what we think we should have or what we think we're entitled to have as a result. In other words, we move from thinking, oh, this is nice, to why can't I have it? I have to have what that person has. Now it's rather subtle. It's often an unconscious process that we're caught unawares, but it is happening. It does happen to us. And if you don't believe me, if I was to run consistently through my message advertisements for KFC across the screen from now till we finish, Guess what message you're getting? And as it gets closer to lunch, what do you think your thought processes will be? Oh, that KFC is not a bad idea. What have I done? I have suggested something to you. You focused on it. Your tummy starts to rumble. It might even groan. And then as it gets close to lunchtime, you're thinking, yeah, KFC. And of course, there's one just over the road. How easy is that? Consumerism, it's there. But in a moment, we make split decisions on what we see. 
You see, all these social media platforms can introduce new idols into our hearts and minds. The things that will turn us away from God and empower us to have our own substitutions, things, in other words, that we have control over. We are drawn to the externals, those things that are presented to us with images of what could be. And the more we see, the more we use these devices, you find that they're all singing from the same choir sheet. The message is the same. They're telling us things we want to hear. They're telling us things that we want to believe. They're telling us, hey, these things are valuable. These things are worthy. These things, if you embrace them, will bring you joy and happiness. And you know what? Before you know it, you've bought it. You've bought into that message. You press the button, buy. And then you bought it. Maybe an hour later you think, what did I buy that for? But you've been caught into the message. Something that somebody has said to you is what you need. It'll, it'll be value. A rainy day situation. You might need it. So we do it. And I wonder if I had the ability to access all your Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, internet activities for this week and I was able to put them up on the screen, I wonder what they would reveal about you and me and where our thoughts have been. What would they show? What would our interests have been? I wonder what products I've been looking at. What things have we been following? All I'm saying is what these things do reveal where we're at. And often we are the center of the universe and it's about what we want and these things reveal it. Now, it's no wonder that it's hard for us to admit that we have a problem with covetousness because no one wants to admit, yes, that's me. But it is reaching epic proportions, and we're unaware of the impact that it is having on our communities. Now, the cause contemplated. To covet means that we often lust after something, or we lust after someone that doesn't belong to us. Coveting, though, the cause of it goes beneath the external actions, in other words, this desire to buy, and it reveals the real condition of our hearts and minds. It reveals the how, the why, and it challenges us when we first entertain any thoughts about what we want. You know, it's a seed thought. It comes to mind, and it can be through a message. It can be through an image. And as our next slide says, James, but people are tempted when their own evil desire leads them away and traps them. This desire leads to sin and then the sin grows and brings death. Now we're going to, we've examined all the other nine commandments and they instruct us when we look at them, don't steal, don't um, commit adultery. They're all these commandments that tell us don't do these things. Because when we break them, people can see, yep, you stole that. Yep, you told a lie. Yep, you committed adultery. There are the visible things that people can see that we have broken the commands. But let me ask you, how do you see whether a person has broken this commandment, do not covet? What evidence is there? I'm sitting here this morning. Are you covetous? Are you guilty of coveting? You see, I can't tell. I can't tell. If you stole, I can tell. If you commit adultery, I can tell. If you lie, I can tell. But covetousness, how do I tell? How do I 
to tell. You see, we can hide our motives of why. Nobody else knows, but God does. He knows all things. I've said that greed and covetousness are often partners in crime because they share similarities in the way they impact people. They both desire, they both want more, and are never satisfied very long. And this illustration might do it. Let's just say you're out in the desert, you have no water, all you have is 24 cans of Coca-Cola. That's all you have to drink. So you're thirsty. What are you going to do? There is Coca-Cola. It says, drink me. Now you're thinking to yourself, but it's not good for me. It's only going to make me thirsty. I don't want it. But you're getting thirstier. So you will pick up that can and you'll scull it down. Done. Five minutes later, what are you feeling? So you have another one. Ten minutes later, you're feeling thirsty. You want another one and another one and another one. In other words, these things will not satisfy. But you will keep on drinking them and basically you'll drink enough of them and it will eventually detilibate your health and you'll eventually die. And that's the bottom line concerning the truth about covetousness. The eyes are never satisfied, the heart and mind are never satisfied, and the soul is never satisfied. It always wants more, just a little bit more, but it wants more. When a person uses only their eye gate to see what they think they need, they become blind in their understanding and discernment of what they really need. And they won't listen to rhyme or reason because they're convinced they know what is best. Covetousness is all about wants rather than needs. A person who allows covetousness to rule isn't concerned about what God has to say or what anybody else has to say. They are preoccupied with getting ahead. They are preoccupied with moving forward to a better life where they feel if they get these things, they will be satisfied. And so they're determined to get what they feel will make them happier. The person's thinking and attitude really reflects where their heart is. They say to themselves, I must have my own way. If I want a particular man or woman, then I'll do whatever I have to do to make it happen, even if that includes breaking up a marriage to get what I want. If there's a position I want and someone else has it, then I'll do everything within my power to get it. I want to be free to do whatever I want, whenever I want, because I can and I'm not going to allow anything or anyone to stop me from getting what I want. The lie of covetousness believes that I have the right to do whatever I please. And in a person's heart and mind, he says to God, don't get in my way. Don't get in my way. Don't try stopping me. It's the lie that believes and puts self on the throne and is saying I am God I'll do whatever I want covetousness is a trap and when we try to satisfy our desires by pursuing the things this world has to offer we only find that the more and the harder we try to get the things the world offers the less they seem to satisfy us it only gives us temporary satisfaction and then leaves us empty and unfulfilled. We want more and more and more. So it comes from the heart. It's a hard issue. We've got the cause contemplated. 
Covetousness is so subtle, it has many coverings. It cloaks itself to hide its real intention and purpose. And it does so because it cloaks that it wants self to be on the throne of this life. And it believes that everything in this life is there for their own personal gratification. Everything in life is meant to be here for me and it's meant to please me. That's what it's all about. Its mantra is, it's all about me, it's all about what I want, and I don't care how I get it. I don't care who I hurt, who I rob, who I kill, how many lives I must tell, or how many lives I must wreck. I'm going to do whatever I want, and I don't care about the consequences as long as I get what I want. That's the mantra when self was on the throne. You might be thinking, well, Pastor, that's not me. I'm young enough. I haven't, I'm not one of these old people you're talking about. I want to experience what life has to offer, and I'm not prepared to wait until I get it. Well, as you see on the board there, uh, there's a story that Jesus tells. But Jesus said to him, who said I should judge or decide between you? Then Jesus said to them, be careful and guard against all kinds of greed. Life is not measured by how much one owns. Then Jesus told this story. There was a rich man who had some land which grew a good crop. He thought to himself, what will I do? I have no place to keep all my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll store all my grain and other goods. Then I can say to myself, I have good enough things stored to last for many years. Rest, eat, drink and enjoy life. But God said to him, foolish man, tonight your life will be taken from you so you will get those things you have prepared for yourself so who will get those things you prepared for yourself this is how it will be for those who store up things for themselves and are not rich towards God you see you can amass many many things but when you die what's going to happen to them all who's going to enjoy them I guess who's going to get them you can't take them to the grave with you so death and the grave are good equalizers when every person is buried six foot under the ground your possessions your property means diddly squat to you when you're six foot under you can't do anything about it our text breaks down the process of covenant covetousness into three areas and that's what our text talks about the first thing is property do not covet your neighbor's house or field now we all have dreams of where we'd like to live now let me ask you what is the perfect house for you what's the perfect house for you and your family if you had unlimited resources, what would your house be like? <coughs> Come on, tell me. Don't be bashful. What would it be like? What would it have? A big pool. You know, I was waiting for some person to say, Pastor, the best house for me is the one I own now. The best house for me is the one I'm in. But nobody said that. Why? Does that mean you're dissatisfied with your house? Is it too small? Is it too big? Could it be better? You see a man's home is his castle. And often today, there are some very nice houses. I mean, they've made series on TVs about houses and renovations and wow, the transformations that take place. And of course, when you see the works done there and you look at yours and you think, 
man, if I knocked that wall out and I took that wall out and I, I opened this up and I did this, what is that? It's covetousness. It's dissatisfaction with what we have. But all of us dream, we have a dream home. What it would be like with all the furnishings, everything in it. And it's not wrong to have these thoughts. But you see, these images in my mind promise me that when I get these things, I'll be happy. That I'll live happily ever after. The problem is, like myself these things get old uh. in other words like me I won't say I'll rust out but things are not functioning in the way they used to they're not brand new they haven't got the same sparkle or the same energy why because things age and things will deteriorate we can't always just have everything new but you know these things and they are things will not bring lasting happiness or satisfaction simply because I go out and get them yes for the moment they're wonderful yes I can show them off but you know they lose their shine and they lose their appeal they never will satisfy the deepest longings that I have within them and if the Lord chooses to give me hallelujah I'll accept them as a gift but it becomes wrong when I'm consumed by an overwhelming drive to attain these things and do whatever it takes to get them. And there are many people that are driven in this world to get the very best that the world has and say, look what I've done, look what I've got. It means that I've fallen into the trap of covetousness and it will only lead me down the path of disappointment in the end. And who knows what kind of destruction and pain I could cause by trying to force these things to happen. How many people find themselves in financial bondage, marital crisis, family disputes and more because of their efforts to satisfy a personal obsession? And property is one thing. Now we go to the next thing our text says is people. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. A covetous heart cannot be content. It looks at another man's wife and says, Oh, if I had a wife that looks like her, wow. I've got a message for you. You better be content with what God has given you. The grass always looks greener on the other side till you get there, and it's not. You might be a married person who's not happy with your husband or wife. You might be looking at somebody else's spouse with admiration, befriending them, hoping there might be an opportunity for you to end up with them. You think that being married to them will finally make you happy. So rather than making up with your own spouse, you pursue a relationship with somebody else's, letting one thing lead to another. They're the bait and you're getting sucked into a trap. And it's the same thing applies if I could only get this job or that job, then I'd be satisfied. You wouldn't. If the good Lord gave you $2,000 a day, do you think you'd be satisfied? If he gave you $10,000 a day, would you be satisfied? Now, to start with, you might be. You're thinking, wow, $10,000 a day, what could I do with this? But you know, after a while, it loses its savour. It doesn't appeal anymore. You might be single. You might be thinking that, oh, I need a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I need to get engaged or married. And if I do that, it'll give me a happy life that I long for, that I want, I desire. And so you're driven by that desire. You can't just, you've got to fulfil it. You must have someone by your side. And of course, this is another lie because what end up happens is that for the wrong reasons, you pursue somebody and you end up in divorce and down a, a path that leads to destruction. It's a trap. It's good to want to get married, but marriage is a gift that God gives us to enjoy. But it's not okay to be consumed by 
this desire. So you've got property, you've got people. And the last one is, in our text, possessions. Do not covet your neighbour's male servant or female servant. And this is important. In Israel society, families and possessions were organised under the headship of a patriarch. And that person, in other words, it would be the, the male leader who would acquire fields, vineyards, buildings, machinery, flocks, herds, sons, daughters and servants. They were all considered part of his estate. The role of a servant would range from a minimum wage field worker to possibly the second in command next to the patriarch himself. So to covet another person's servant was to covet a valuable possession of their master, like coveting his oxen or donkey as well. So if we take the thought that is expressed there in our text, in a modern context, it translates into material possessions, furniture, vehicles, uh, power tools, kitchen appliances, you name it. We have been inundated with advertising and messages that tell us that to find true happiness in life, we need to have what everybody else has. If we get these things, it will make our life easier. Now, I can remember when computers first came round that if you got a computer, it would make your life easier. That's the biggest lie out. How much time do you waste and spend on computers? Have they made your life easier? Do you spend less time on them? No. But we all bought into the lie. And often we need to have the best and the biggest and we need to have it all so we can do whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it. So we buy, buy, buy. We even buy things we can't afford. We store and stockpile and build sheds and rent storage units just so we can fit all our stuff. What it means is we've taken a bait, hook, line and sinker, that tells us by having all this stuff, we'll be happy. But a challenge to consider, how much do we think about God? How much can I please God with my life and help others to know him? Or is my mind usually preoccupied with certain earthly things that I want? What takes precedent in our minds is a clue to what's most important to us, to what we love and what we desire the most. So there are things that would confront us in a modern sense, just as it did when this was written. The consequences confronted. How dangerous is this commandment in relationship to all the other commandments? Well, it breaks all of them. This 10th commandment breaks all the other nine. That's how important it is and how serious it is. What is the first commandment? You can see it up there in the board. You shall have no other gods before me. When we are guilty of coveting, we become idolaters because we're putting other things, other people in place that rightfully belong to God alone. So we break this commandment. In other words, a covetous person makes the world their God and lives only for what they can get from this life. In other words, this life is all there is and all that matters. So the drive for riches, possessions and pleasures, the motto is live for the here and now. Don't worry about the hereafter. It's idolatry because it places self on the throne and self rules over life and self gets what it wants. So it breaks the first commandment. The second commandment, <coughs> don't make any idols. Coveting does this when a person sets their heart on things they worship and believe they must have. The person who covets has no time for an invisible God. They're only interested in the things that they can touch, taste and see. They are the gods to be worshipped. And that's what our world is centred around and that's the message given. Touch, taste, seal. That's all I'm interested in. The third commandment, 
don't take the name of the Lord in vain. The person who covets and leaves their spouses to chase after somebody else's spouse and says, the Lord told me to get a divorce and then move forward on my own so that I'd be a better person in doing this, so I'm only doing what the Lord told me. Now, you might laugh at this, but I've heard this. This is a reason that's given. The Lord told me I had to leave my wife and go after this one because it's the right thing to do. So I'm just doing what the Lord told me. Well, I can tell you categorically, the Lord does not tell you to do that. It's opposite of the very thing that he tells you. The Lord never leads you to commit and do a sin. And what that is, is sin. It's taking the Lord's name in vain and saying, I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do, brother. That's what he told me. I'm listening, so I did it. He never leads a person to sin. Coveting is simply letting your heart get what you wanted. It's telling you, go for it, get it. So it takes the Lord's name in vain when it uses him as a source to say, yes, do it. The fourth commandment, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. The person who covets wants this day for themselves. Now this person may attend religious services on a regular basis, but their heart's not really in it. They go through the motions. They are far away from God. They're doing what's expected. But they don't really want to be here. Their heart's not in it. And they break. This day is the Lord's day. It's a day where we give thanks to God for who and what he is. The fifth commandment, honour your mother and father. A person who covets, desires and wants even demands their own way, demands his own rule and becomes his own authority, will recognise no other authority but his own. So instead of respecting the authority figures that God has appointed and put in place for our safety and protection, it's replaced by an authority that has no restrictions and knows no boundaries that believes it's free to do whatever it wants. In other words... I want to be the boss. I do not want to be told what to do. I will tell you what to do. It's not honouring your father and mother. The sixth commandment, you'll not kill. A person who covets will take whatever steps and use whatever methods they must to get what they believe they're entitled to. In other words, covetousness has a price. It drives a person to get what they want and they're willing to pay the price to get it and no price is too high to pay in order to get it even if they have to kill for it the seventh commandment don't commit adultery a person who covets will do whatever it takes to satisfy their fleshly desires it is covetousness brings out the selfishness that leads people to abandon their spouses and families, their homes and jobs, in order to fulfill their sexual fantasies. Jesus provides us with the following advice in Matthew 5, 27, 28, when he says, You have heard that it was said you must not be guilty of adultery. But I tell you that if anyone looks at a woman and wants to sin sexually with her, in his mind he has already done that sin with the woman. So he's very precise. The Eighth Commandment, do not steal. When a person who covets is not satisfied with what God has given him and believes that he's entitled to something better and is determined to take that which doesn't belong to him and for which he has no right to have, covetousness makes people thieves in their relationship to time, money, property and pleasure. So it breaks the Eighth Commandment. The ninth commandment, do not bear false witness. The person who covets his neighbour has, uh, as a person that will make up stories and untruths that will provide him with an opportunity to take advantage of his neighbour's misfortune. So basically when we look at things in this way, the consequences of covetousness are horrendous and they impact everybody in the community. Covetousness is being discontent with what we have in this life. Now let me ask you this morning, 
Are you content with what you have? Are you discontented? Are you looking at what others have and comparing what they have and envy what they have and think if I just had a little bit of what they had, I'd be happy. If my bank account was just, you know, a little bit more than what it is, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be satisfied for very long at all. So this 10th commandment shows us the nature and character of covetousness. It's not seen by external behaviours where you can place a restriction or a penalty on it as you can in the other commandments. If I kill somebody, I know there's a penalty. I know there's a penalty. But what's the penalty for covetousness? How can I restrict it? Because the big deal about covetousness, it has its source in our hearts, and that's the big deal. This is the place where all our thinking processes begin. This is where they grow and mature and branch out into other things. So covetousness comes under the cloak of other problems before it reveals itself as the true source of all other problems. As James 1 says, do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that war within you. You want things, but you do not have them. So you are ready to kill and are jealous of other people, but you still cannot get what you want. So you argue and fight. You do not get what you want because you do not ask God. And that's the question. Have you asked God? Or when you ask, you do not receive because the reason you ask is wrong. You want things so you can use them for your own pleasures. So you're not loyal to God. You should know that loving the world is the same as hating God. Anyone who wants to be a friend of the world becomes God's enemy. Do you think the scripture means nothing that says the spirit that God made to live in us wants us for himself alone? So covetousness essentially is friendship with the world. It's a love for the world and the things of the world. And when that happens, it puts us in direct opposition to God and makes us an enemy of God. God's purpose is for us to receive his love and share it with our neighbours. You see, it's not all about us. It's not all about what we want. It's about what he wants. And anyone see Dr. David Jeremiah this morning? He had a little gem. He was talking about the church and he was talking about as you get older, you know, 65. What happens when you get to the age of 65? Um, there's some people here and not the age of 65, excuse me. But are you looking forward to the age of 65? What are you going to do when you're 65? Come on, you're going to kick back and relax you're going to do absolutely nothing you're going to go on a beach you're going to enjoy life you're going to be served you're going to have all these things you're going to enjoy life right and he said that's one of the worst things that as Christians we can do because God has given each one of us as believers a job to do not everything, but a job to do. And he's getting near 80. And he said, you know, each day is new for me. He said, I look forward to that time as well, of uh, retiring. But the Lord had other plans for me, and my job hasn't finished. And what he found is that as people are getting older, particularly Christians, they get to that age of 65 and think, now it's time for me to retire. It's time for me to just take life easy and he said it couldn't be further from the truth as you've reached this age you've matured you have wisdom you have knowledge you have all these things now is not that time to retire now is the time to be able to pass it on to the younger ones you have work still to do and isn't that so true 
We've been caught up with what the world says. This is what you should do at age 65, age 70, age 80. This is what you should be doing. God says, no, I've given you a work. You haven't finished it yet, so keep doing it. So at no age do we give in and just say, I'm going to let go and retire. Use your gifts. Pass them on to the next person. But what I'm saying is these are things that we need to be able to pass on to others. Now, covetousness says live for self. God says live for me, serve me. And that means the cultivation of contentment. Cultivation of contentment. I didn't put that up, I don't think. Yes, I did. If someone spreads false teaching and does not agree with sound words, that is, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the teaching that accords with godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in controversies and verbal disputes. This gives rise to envy, dissension, slanders, evil suspicions, constant bickering by people corrupted in their minds, deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a way of making a profit. Now, godliness combined with contentment brings great, great profit. For we have brought nothing into this world, and so we can ta not take a single thing out either. But if we have food and shelter, we'll be satisfied with that. Those who long to be rich, however, stumble into temptation and a trap and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evils. Some people, in reaching for it, have strayed from the faith and stabbed themselves with many pains. Truth that we need to pay attention to. Covetousness is a struggle. And I say it's a struggle for believers as well. Because it comes down to the bottom line that says... Is God enough to meet and supply all my needs? Is God enough? Is God big enough to take care of all my needs and my family's needs? The text above defines covetous as wanting something so badly you lose your contentment for God. And Paul says there's great contentment or great gain in godliness with contentment. When people become discontented with God, then covetousness for other things rapidly increases. It puts self in place of God, and if self is not content with things that come from God, then it starts to look elsewhere to find satisfaction and happiness that it believes it's entitled to. Covetous is subtle, and when a person falls into the sin of covetousness, his thoughts are consumed with the world and everything in it and what it has to offer. He makes plans and investments around those things that this life offers in the here and now, has very few thoughts about eternity and what it looks like. He'll look at that when he gets there. His thoughts revolve around his work, his house, his family and pleasure, and how he can acquire more assets or interests in his investments while finding the time for doing the 101 other things that will give him satisfaction while he lives on this earth. A person who lives like this or the person who lives the opposite of coveting everything in life finds true contentment and peace in what the Lord has given him. That's true contentment. Because he knows that one day his life will end and he knows that he cannot take anything from earth with him and so he invests his time, his talents, his energy into things that are eternal and this will give him far more satisfaction than he'll ever find in the things of this earth. Can you imagine what it's like if you have spent time with somebody sharing about the gospel and they don't seem to have any interest and then when we get to heaven, that person is there to greet you and say thank you for the time that you shared the gospel with them. Somebody else might have come along and did a little bit more work but the seed was planted because you took the time. It can be a thought. It can be a, an email. It can be prayer. All of these things are sowing things for eternity. They matter. And they'll provide you with much greater satisfaction knowing that than have all the money in the world. 
He won't give you the contentment you're looking for. Our actions speak louder than our words. And I guess this morning, what does this commandment tell us about our relationship with the Lord and our neighbour? 1 John 5, 15 and 17, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the arrogance provided by material possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with all its desires, but the person who does the will of God remains forever. Covetousness is a hard thing to admit. We're all guilty of it. We're often discontented with what we have. And human nature tells us, look at others and compare ourselves with what they have. As a believer, I need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude and contentment and not take things or people for granted. That's easier said than done. But what does that look like in everyday life? My wife reminded me of this, and it's, it's so true. I wonder how often we take things for granted that are in the home and what's done. I guess as husbands we're guilty of it more than, than any. How often do we notice the things that our wives do? They don't sit stand there and say, here's my list, this is what I've done all day, see what you can find. No, but when we come into the home, what do we find? If it's neat and tidy, who did it? If it's dust free, if it's sparkling clean and there's a smell of food, how did that happen? I know, just presto like that, didn't it? But how much time do we say, oh, thank you for the time that you spent in doing this. Thank you for the meal that you cooked. Thank you for this or thank you for that. Do you think that would make a difference? I think it would. But so often we're so used to it being there that it's happened and we don't take any notice and we don't appreciate it until it's not done. And when it's not done, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why isn't this clean? Why isn't that done? That's when we notice, oh, they used to do all those things. But with an attitude of gratitude, it's being content and say, thank you for what you do. I appreciate it. Thank you for this and this and this. It just makes the person understand that you appreciate it and you're not taking them or what they do for granted. Easier said than done, but it's never too late to start, is it? Two words, thank you. It's so hard to say, isn't it? Thank you. Just try it. No, you don't want to try it. Thank you. Okay, it means something. So we need to be able to do that. You see, I've come to understand that in my situation at this present time, this is where I should be. That's contentment. I am where I'm supposed to be, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So often we think, I wish I was doing this, I wish I was there, I wish I was here, I wish this would happen, but you're here. And this is the place where God wants you to be doing what he wants you to do. And what he's saying is, be content. Because God knows where I am. He knows exactly what I'm doing. And I can trust that he'll keep his promises and he will provide for my family's need. So I'm right where I am, doing what he wants. He'll provide for my needs. Is God more than enough for me? If he isn't, then I'm vulnerable to covetousness. And I need to understand that the more things that I accumulate, the more I must give an account for. Be content with what you have in every circumstances. Now this finishes our look at the Ten Commandments. And I pray that it's been helpful to you 
as it was to me in preparing it. Our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, they're still required for today. Love God, love your neighbour. The scriptures tell us how to do that. Let's be people who put it into practice as the team comes.